Hi, everyone. Today we're joined by Mr. AJ Singh. He is from the renowned kennel farm Patella, which is known the world over, whether it's the United States, Germany, or the Indian subcontinent. Everything. In the German ship. <laughs> <laughs> You've left a mark in all three continents, so, you know. Yeah, you got to right. mention it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and uh, you've been breeding dogs and been involved in the German Shepherd breed since the 1980s. And uh, today we were discussing the topic uh, a little bit before about the German Shepherd type. So what does type mean to you? Well, I think, you know, anytime you're in doubt, you have to go back to the, to the breed standards, you know. And... Anytime, you know, you have to go back to what the original founders, you know, looked at the breed. And if you read the breed standards, the first thing is the goal. You know, the goal was to create a working dog capable of high performance. So when you talk about type, you have to go back to the goal and look at it from a physical standpoint and a mental standpoint and see if this really is the right type. From a type standpoint, does it match the breed standards? Does it, you know, so the, I think the type goes back to the breed standards, both in terms of the uh, the mental makeup of the dog and the and the physical makeup of the dog. So to me, I think, you know, when you say this is a German Shepherd type, most of the people would look at the dog in a show ring and say, oh, yeah, the body type is matches the German Shepherd body type but i think there's a second part to it too i think the mental makeup of the dog has to match the the mental makeup of what the people you know who were the who conceived the breed does it you know is does the mental makeup of the breed matches the breed standards or not so we talk about type in vast generalizations. Normally when we are talking about, like we just spoke about the mentality of the dogs, we spoke about the physical attributes of the dog as mentioned in the breed standard. Recently, I was having a conversation with somebody and this gentleman has imported a couple of dogs from Germany mm -hmm. and he, has, uh, he was looking for options for breeding for his female. And... I mentioned to him, I said, you should, you know, you should consider dogs uh, from uh, which are the type of your female. So what I meant by that was dogs that are not over exaggerated by the type of his female, because his female is a very moderately angulated female. So I wanted him to find a male that he could find uh, a good compatible partner in, with, which would increase the temperament of the dogs, but not take away from the body of the dog as to, sp as to speak to not add too much excessive hind angulation or to take away from the stability of the back, so on and so forth. As, of course, mentioned in the brief center, we should have a straight, strong back. We should have a strong hind quarter, so on and so forth. And then the gentleman out of the blue, he says, yeah, I would breed to your dog, but your dog has a completely different type from mine. Well, what do you mean, I asked him? Oh, you know, your dogs are not show type dogs. Well, so well, I mean, how is show divorcing the dogs from working dog? I think I think the type has less to do with the uh, with the show type, working type. You know, I think we have to get back to the German Shepherd type. Right. Because, I wanted to I wanted to talk about the bastardization of the term, so to speak. Right. I mean, I understand where you're coming from, but I think there's not a different breed standard for the working dogs, and there's not a different breed standard for the show dog. Indeed, the standard for the German Shepherd breed is the same. Within yes. the breed, within the breed standards, we have different, you know, preferences by different breeders, but and we have different preferences whether it's working breeder or a show breeder. Sure. Now, you know, sometimes you know, people who do the sport they want to define the breed by. You know, or I, all they are looking for a dog with a lot of drive. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, and then and you can get back into the same thing too. When you look for a dog with a lot of drive, what good is the drive if the physical attributes are not there? You know, it's like sure. putting a Ferrari engine, you know, in a beat up car. Okay. Sure. You know, yeah, it's gonna run for a day or two, okay. 
but after that everything is going to fall apart okay sure. so i'm not saying that you know a, a dog with a lot of drive in a bad body is going to last for a day or two i'm just saying that eventually you know or the or the working life of that dog can't be too long or even if it is working then you have to constantly maintain the body you know you know you have to give them supplements for this that whatever and try to see if everything stays together for a short time but eventually you know you can't fight nature it's going to you know sure. it's, it's going to fall apart it's going to catch up with you yeah, it's, it's going to catch up yeah, with you exactly you know so so it's, it's it's the same thing i think if you stay true to the type and try to breed a dog within an an efficient body system okay and the other way around too you know i mean you could you could have a body which is like really really efficient but then there is no mindset to perf- no drive because the the other thing that they talk about in there in the breed standards and i'm not i'm not making it up you know the working dog is an efficient working dog due to its constitution and its drive systems so sure. so the forefathers of the breed you know com- wanted to combine the two things they never wanted to separate one from the other okay now if you take one away from the other you're going away from the type now it's, you're coming back to the to to the word what we you know what we call type okay right now within the type you can look at the structure you can say okay now we are splitting the type you know now right. we're going into you know different parts okay of the of the term type okay when you can look at the body structure of a dog and you can say this short dog is short legged this dog is you know is you know the chest could be deeper or this or that when we are looking at individual faults of different dogs and we feel that okay we need to compensate for one thing or another then sure. you can then you can look at the physical attributes you know of the dog from the same standpoint when we look at the drives you can say doesn't have enough you know play drive doesn't have enough you know prey drive doesn't have this doesn't have that you know could be this way could be that way but now now we're getting into the you know nuts and bolts to make a dog which is more which is closer to the type defined by the forefathers of the breed recently uh, we were at the seminar uh, this workshop organized yeah. by the GSDCA and mr uh, weber was the speaker for the breed judges mm-hmm. and he spoke of a term which is our uh, president uh, dr messler has used quite often which is overtypization whether it's anatomical overtypization or character overtypization in drives meaning the dog shouldn't be too exaggerated one way or another whether it's mentally or physically what would you uh, say to that over the mental uh, exaggeration the physical exaggeration we're all familiar with with the roached backs the rounded backs the loose rear quarters the over excessive angulation in the rear quarters lack of firmness etc but let's talk a little bit about the over type position and the temperament which a lot of people are very vague about why well, you know you you and i have been with the breed for a long time okay sure we yeah. have we have trained dogs we have worked dogs we have seen other people train dogs you know and you know i think one of one comment that i've heard from multiple people now oh the show people judges would say we went over to we interviewed some some herding people and they sure. came back and they said oh what they call working dog is not really a working dog because they're not good for herding sheep sure. and even people like you know you know Carl Fuller who was the herding guy he went over yes. to you know he, he went over to show dogs you know to yes. uh, to 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 produce herding dogs 
I never talked to Carl Fuller myself, okay? So I, I, sure. won't, I won't quote him. And most of the people who are quoting him, I don't think met Carl <laughs> Fuller either, okay? <laughs> so, you know, and I highly... You know, there, there's a meme with Abraham Lincoln's photo on it that says, don't believe everything you listen to or hear yes. on the internet. And that 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 is so much so true, okay? Because I don't I don't think that I think some of these guys are coming up with their own version of what Carl Carl Fuller would say, okay? Whatever suits the motive at the well, time. Exactly. So I'm not yeah. totally buying into that statement, which I've heard from multiple sources. You know, saying, "Oh, you know, the hurting people say this," or the you know, like name me the hurting person that you talk to. Okay, so and well, the 50 ones, years ago, and the ones you're quoting have been dead for a long time. Okay, so right. now don't put words in the dead man's mouth. Okay, and right. so, so, so I don't believe that is true. Okay, but what we have seen is, you know, and even even the when they say, "Oh, he's totally aggressive dog," you know, and this sure. and that. I mean. Over the you know, last 20, 30 years, I don't know how many overly aggressive dogs I have seen, okay? Sure. I mean, I can count them, you know, on one hand, okay? I, I think it's more reactivity that they're talking about aggression, which is being classified as aggression or mis, uh, miscategorized as aggression. It's just reactivity to the situation. But that's faulty temperament, and see, it's been there for a long time. You know, is yes, it, is, is it, it's nothing new. No, it's nothing new. It's part of even Captain, even Captain Stefanitz in his book mentioned uh, staying away from sport dogs and not to fall in the rut of breeding sport dogs. Yeah, but I think the sport at that time was probably defined much differently than sport today. Okay, sure. I think today the it, sport has become even more about the bean counters than it was then. I mean, today the sport, you know, people who define the sport who don't have any history in the, you know, in the, in the breed, you know, they, they define the dog by the scorebook that you would get from, you know, an IGP trial at a different level, right? Absolutely. And the, but I don't think there were professional trainers either at that time, you know, Mr. Fuller was, I mean, Mr. Fuller, uh, the, when, when the breed was conceived, and even up yes. until recently, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't see so much of professionalism in the in the sport that we are seeing today. I think the rise of the professional trainer has been somewhat of a phenomenon since the mid 90s, I'd say. Right. So the, the, so the point is, if you have time to to work on little things, okay? I think now what we are doing is we are put, the sport was invented, you know, basically to help the breed, okay? Sure. Now the sport is doing more for the trainers and less for the breed. You know, that's the sure. honest, that's the honest answer I can come up with because the professional trainers make so much more money from you know from standing on the podium and getting their pictures taken and the publicity that they get from you know from the podium that that the that the breed becomes secondary because now we are charging so much money for the seminars and the guy who you know placed first must be a better painter than the next guy so we need to bring him over and we need to go, you know, we need to train with that guy. Here's so, here's the goofy thing about the seminars too, though. Now you've got people that are hopping from seminar to seminar to seminar. Oh, so and so is going to come into town uh, this weekend. Sign me up for classes for this gentleman. Then so and so is coming the next weekend. Sign me up for classes with this gentleman. Their training or concepts might have nothing to do with each other. Now your dog's going through multiple schools, so so to speak. But, over but, and over and over again. And now the dog has no situation to learn and grow in a normal club environment as it used to. I, I think what you have to say is that, you know, it's like, 
you know, you have a kindergartner at home. Sure. And you're looking for, you know, a PhD specialist teacher. Okay. Sure. And I'm, I'm nothing against a PhD specialist teacher. This PhD specialist teacher is very good if you put him in a situation where, you know, he has the right thing to work on because they're very, very specialized. Okay. Sure. But but what we are forgetting is that what you need is someone who has time and is willing to help you, especially for the newcomers. And that's Absolutely. way that's way more important. And this is where the club structure came into play in the older days. Right. Okay. We had a club structure where everyone worked together and helped the younger people as yes. a group. There was not one person, so there was not a tooth fairy visiting every, you know, yeah, every year to show them what to do. You know, the yeah. the, the club members helped each other. We sh maybe we weren't perfect, to, you know. Sure. Maybe we didn't know how to fix dogs' problems. You know, who had problems? Okay. Yeah, but, yeah. But overall, we got the dog to the point where the dog was good enough to start and the person could handle the dog on his own, you know, and start doing, you know, more work. I mean, th there are people, there are trainers who would help you even learn how to teach the basics because, you know, the, the sport is evolving. Our understanding of the yes. dog's behavior is evolving. Yeah. There are new methods coming in. So from time to time, we need people who can say, if you start your dog this way, in this yeah. way, you're better off down the road because it'll be easier or or you'll put a good foundation. And, and, and if we have seminars like that for newcomers, I'm all for it. I think it would, right. it would benefit a lot of people, maybe maybe they can put out the videos and i know some of the trainers have done that but yes, yes of course but when you go to the seminars i think it's better to go to a seminar with a problem one or two problems okay as opposed to you know a beginner goes to a specialized seminar you know you're still going Okay, there's so much to learn and how much can they grasp in one seminar, okay? Whereas if you go to a seminar with a specific problem and work on it for a short time, and hopefully within two, three days of your seminar, you have got some kind of direction to fix that problem. And then you can continue on on your own. But I think if this if this trainer has given you a solution for that problem, it is better to stick with the same trainer rather than, you know, work halfway with problem solving and then go to another person who may have a totally different approach, you know, to fix that problem. So that's that's my two cents worth on, you know, on how to fix problems, you know, in training, you know, or how, how I feel about seminars. So here's my question to that. If yeah. the sport's gotten so complicated that we need to seek out specialists to fix our problems, if we're looking for things to create, essentially, like, you know, it's like they're talking about quality of barking or they're talking about quality of grips, the definition of grips, which varies from judge to judge. They're talking about healing pictures. They're talking about tracking behaviors. I mean... It's enough, if you're not fanatical about this stuff like we are, it's enough to drive any new person. It's like, mm, I don't think it's for me. I'm going to go try something easy like rally obedience. No, it, it, would even, it would even drive experienced people's, people nuts, okay? There's, there's something to be said about, okay, we all want to learn at different levels, young or old, sure. whatever, right? But then if you make it so specialized, you could get to a point one where the sport has gone, which is it has gone away, especially the national international championships. They have gone yeah. away from average, you know, handlers. Okay. Because 
the problem is if you have don't have time as much as these you know people who are the professional doing, trainers professional trainers on full time basis yeah. right yeah yeah then you're not giving your dog a fair shake okay you not you cannot if you haven't put in the time if you haven't worked as hard as these people you know accessibility to high level helpers Absolutely. accessibility to yeah exactly yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost like you, you are studying for an entrance examination, right? And you don't, you don't have access to good, good study books. Tutors. Like, yeah, tutors, whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you're not smart. No. All, it, all it means is that you don't have the resources, you know, that the yeah. other people have, okay? And... Yes, you know, I'm not taking anything away from professional trainers because sure. if there was no need for them, they wouldn't be around, okay? Absolutely. So so there's definitely a need for professional trainers, nothing against. Sure. But as far as... Well, well, when we say professional trainers, we mean professional Shutton trainers or IGP trainers. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but but I really think that the quality of dog is different than... I mean, just because a dog has performed really well under specialized training, okay? Sure. Whether it's show or work, you know? Sure, or sure. IGP, work means IGP in the way we kind of see it, okay? Yeah. I'm not saying yeah. IGP is the only type of work, but I'm just saying that, you know, this is how you and I would talk about work because this is what sure. we're more familiar with. But sure. then... But I, I, I feel that I think the dog has to be looked at event, you know, as, a, as a breed value of the dog, as, you know, it has to be looked, looked at in context with the breed standards, not in context with the placement at a, at a show. And I'm not taking anything away. If a dog meets the breed standards and is also a good dog you know who places high you know whether in show or in work but it's a it's a complete dog you shouldn't walk away from that dog either absolutely yeah. so now this this type of uh culture let's say let's call it culture because that's what it has become this type of culture has given rise to a new form of judges that we affectionately call the bean counters and it's also given rise to a type of dog that is promoted by these bean counters because of the training that is involved with these dogs. Well, and I'm going to come back to the same thing. You and I went through the training, right? As a yes. as judges, right? Yes. Where we were, where we were, you know, given a set of rules. Sure. Now, and we were saying, we were told, if the dog does this, you have to take so many points off. If, sure. So. I think a dog who's judging a sport, okay, sure, IGP competition, yes, you know, so sometimes the the set of rules he's handed to make him a bean, bean counter, okay, sure, but the breeder doesn't have to go along with what the judge says, okay, and absolutely. And the other thing is, a judge's opinion could be controversial too, because the judge sure. looks at a dog on a certain day. So to go beyond the performance and make an opinion, because when when I was thinking about the same thing early on, I would say, you know, maybe a judge could make a comment saying, you know, he has really good breed value blah 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 sure okay. if you like the dog find the points as the saying goes yeah and yeah you can find some points but you cannot sure. you cannot give him you know this with you have you have to give the dog points within the context of the rules too of course okay. of course you know so so even when you are a little liberal with your scoring you know with a dog that you really like Okay, and I'm sure most of us are like that. Okay, sure, we're all human after all, right? Um, you still cannot guarantee that he would be the winner. 
Okay. Of and course. Even if, even if you make a dog a winner, you cannot hold the, you know, you cannot force anyone to go breed to this dog, right? You may absolutely so all at the end of the day, we control our own choices as breeders, but we cannot tell other yeah. people. I mean, you've done that. I have done that. Okay. But, and we all, we both feel that, you know, we have done. Well. I could give two, the, I would give two craps about what some judge has to say about a dog personally. Well, and I, I think I, it's the same I, for I you. Would, I would listen to them, but I would, you know, I would, I would not only totally base my opinion on what the judge says, you know, right, you know, but, but even some of the judges, you, you talk to them after they are done judging, and you ask them about certain dogs, and sure. and I have learned that a lot of times their opinions are not much different than than yours, except the only difference is they are bound by the rules okay sure. and they cannot go out and say yeah this is my favorite dog and i'm gonna give him 100 points okay it doesn't right. work it doesn't work like no. that yeah so absolutely okay I agree. so so then the then the judge won't be doing his job right yeah. okay. within reason you have to be With, always within reason within reason so but but i have also talk to some judges they have come back to me and they said yeah the dog is definitely a breeding type dog but today he didn't do this or whatever sure okay. so i think i think the, the the main thing that you know from today's discussion that we are going to walk away from even though it started with a totally different topic okay and we knew that we that's would, the beauty of these yeah is that don't look at the placements at a show or a working competition to select sure. a breeding partner. Okay. Look at the type of the dog, the look, breeding type. I, of the dog. On, and, and look at the type means you have to understand, you have to do reading, you have to learn about the type, you have to come up with your own type, you have to come up with your own preferences, you know. and Based, and, of course, upon the original blueprint. Yeah. Yes, of course, within the confines of the breed standards, okay? Right, like there's a lot of these uh, breeders that are trying to make Malinois out of German Shepherds with that, so... Well, it's, it's, it's their choice. We can't control them. I mean, my feeling is... Right. The, the main reason we are doing these videos is... Yes. To educate other people, not to force other people or not to put them... Well, of course down. not. Yeah. It's a free country. Yeah, and, and, and I don't mean to put them down by... You know, by saying, "Hey, you guys are breeding Malinois. Now you're not breeding shepherds, or you, you know, you're breeding, you know, show dogs who can only, you know, run in a ring, but they cannot jump. They're not agile. I mean, they are, the ones that can't jump have a hard time running in the ring too. But, but, but the the point is, it's like constitution, right? When in doubt, yes. read the constitution, right? Absolutely. It, you know, it's the it's the same with the dogs. It's when guaranteeing you, this conversation we're having right now. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's the main thing. When in doubt, go to the breed standards. Absolutely. Okay. That's a uh, good place to leave it. All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Have <laughs> a good night. Okay, bye.